There are a lot of things to consider when it comes to making a good video game sequel. Does it expand upon the established themes and world building without retconning huge swaths of already built up ideas? Does it introduce new and interesting mechanics off the back of what came before? Does the conclusion of the first title even warrant a sequel being made, or is this just a desperate cash grab? These questions, and many more that I'm just not smart enough to think of, are all important ideas to consider when looking at something like Sly 2 Band of Thieves and asking yourself is this a good sequel? Is this deserving of a place in the Sly Cooper universe? Of course, you could just shut up and enjoy the silly little video game for what it is, but for the sake of argument, pretend you're as pretentious as I am. So sit down, buckle up, heat up some popcorn, maybe actually use that popcorn button this time, and join me for the next couple of minutes, and I'm going to talk about the story, gameplay, and many, many crimes within Sly 2 Band of Thieves. We join our favorite criminal in the midst of yet another heist for the greater good of all, this time in the Museum of Natural History and disappointingly not at 4.20 in the morning. Sly refuses to use codenames properly because, well, everyone knows who they are anyway, and it turns out the boys are out in the field for the first time, so make note of that for a little bit later. We're here to steal back some pieces of clockwork, the big metal bird man responsible for the last game. Just like that, we're into things and I can talk about some of the controls. Most everything is the same as the last game, with the exception of actually having vertical control over the camera this time around. Press X to jump, the left analog stick moves us around, circle performs everyone's favorite super sneaky thief moves, and square swings the cane around to smash stuff and people at will. Everything feels great here. It's responsive, simple, and all that you expect it to be. Swinging the cane around lacks impact, I guess, but looking at these little twig arms, it makes sense. Jump on a bouncy thing onto the back of a giant whale skeleton, which brings up a debate for which animals are actually people in this world, and we flip the switch to bring up Bentley. The shockingly computer literate turtle turns off the security ahead, allowing us to stealthily smash things up as we sneak on. A bit of tightrope walking later, and we meet up with Murray, codename The Murray, to help us get past a really heavy gate. We get to where the clockwork part should be, but unfortunately for Sly, they're gone, and we have to play the rest of the game. Carmelita's new partner, Neela, points out that we probably didn't steal them, given that we are here to steal them right now, and points us toward the Claw Gang being the likely suspects. Carmelita escorts us out, shooting wildly inside a building filled with priceless artifacts, and we head off to chase down the Claw Gang, and steal back the clockwork parts so that they can't be used for evil. Moral high ground achieved, let's go beat up a lizard. These cutscenes still don't have subtitles, by the way. Our first villain, Dimitri, is guilty of forging famous art and running a successful nightclub, I guess, but he's got a clockwork part, so he's up first on our hit list. Before I go into what this guy is doing and how we plan to stop him, it's time to talk about the wild change in mission structure going into Sly 2. Gone are the days of a mostly useless central hub surrounded by scattered and disconnected missions to get a big key. The levels in Sly 2 are a story in and of themselves. Each member of the Claw Gang is doing something bad with a clockwork part, and we're here to steal the part back while also stopping their evil ways. Every single task we complete is done for a sometimes ridiculous but very specific reason that helps to get us to the end goal. Missions also take place either in the level proper or in an appropriate building contained within the level. We sneak around, pickpocketing keys from guards patrolling the streets, break into a guest building to steal the various pieces of a tuxedo for a ballroom dance sequence, and so, so much more that mostly revolves around sneaking and stealing. Each one of these tasks is performed with a specific intent. See, at the start of each world, we infiltrate the building with the clockwork part and snap some photos to figure out both what it's being used for and then how to take it down. After this, Sly and the gang have a water cooler moment going over the plan for how to proceed. This plan details each course of action and who's going to perform it. What's that? Did you hear me say who's going to perform it? Well, turns out the other two decided to actually be more than just pretty faces this time and actually get their hands wet, and they both play very differently to Sly himself. Bentley, the little green WMD, focuses on hacking and using darts to put enemies to sleep. Once they're knocked out, he laces the area with bombs to ensure they'll never wake up again. Murray, being ever so slightly below the bell curve and the size of a lifted Ram 1500, doesn't do stealth in the traditional sense. It's a much more Hitman style of stealth gameplay in that no one can trigger an alarm if they're all dead. Murray uses brute strength and delusion to help out the gang. Overall, my only real complaint with the other members of the gang are the lack of thief moves limiting mobility around the levels, but we'll get to that later. In the meantime, Sly took full advantage of the last 300-ish words to fiddle with some satellites, body slam some guys into the ether, and overall really ruin Dimitri's whole day. See, turns out Dimitri is using Clockwork's tail feathers to somehow print out a lot of counterfeit money. The secret eighth deadly sin, lessening the value of the dollar, is something we can't 
abide, and we need those feathers anyway, so it's time to put a stop to it. To manage this, we'll gather some more intel by bugging Dimitri's office and tailing the man himself. Sounds easy enough, and it is, barring my less than stellar gameplay ability. After this, it's Murray's turn to get some action. He throws some ice cream at a few power boxes and, um, sneaks his way to the pumping station for a bit of sabotage. Now that we've gathered all the intel we need, Bentley has a proper plan. This plan involves Sly shutting down the security cameras, Murray taking out the alarms outside, and dropping a giant disco ball which Bentley refuses to elaborate on. This all mostly goes off without a hitch, but we do run into Neela who offers to help us out. So what, it takes a thief to catch a thief? Something like that. I do not trust this lady. After a bit of sneaking, some destruction, and maybe even a little bit of thieving, we drop the ball to welcome in the new year, kicking off Operation Thunderbird to steal Clockwork's tail feathers. This plan mostly just entails stealing a truck to drop a big bird statue onto a fountain to get at the printing press from above. Super sneaky. Since no one else can think of a better plan, we go with Bentley's and soon find ourselves face to face with our prize. One little problem though, Dimitri is really not happy with us and now we have to fight him. I have no idea what you're saying. And your suit sucks. No! The fight against Dimitri is fine, I guess. I mean, it's no Kung Fu Panda or DDR Crocodile, but he could definitely be worse. Run in, smack him a few times until he flies back, avoid the laser blast I didn't expect him to have, and before you know it, the lizard goes down and we make off just moments before Carmelita shows up. She really needs to get better at her job. The team enjoys a week in Monaco before taking on our next dastardly villain, Rajan. Rajan is at least committing a crime that's a bit more overtly evil, drug trafficking. Spice, because using a real drug loses you that E for everyone rating is a big problem and Rajan is right at the center of it. Rajan is using the clockwork wings as a status symbol in his new palace and it's on us to stop him. Along the way, maybe we'll also stop this trafficking ring as well, but only if we have time. After getting the requisite recon photos and learning Carmelita's here undercover with Neela and the most evil looking police prison warden I've ever seen, we develop our game plan. This time it means taking out a massive security chopper with some roof mounted machine guns. While Sly lowers the drawbridge and Murray takes some warning shots, let's take a moment to talk about some not story stuff. Remember the bottles from the first game? They make a reappearance here, but in a little bit of a different fashion. They're restricted to main level areas only now, and each level only contains 30. Collecting all 30 in one level unlocks the safe hidden somewhere within that level, which this can include some interior mission areas. I did not unlock even a single safe in my playthrough. It's no secret that I've never gone for 100% completion for these videos, but I did look it up and unlocking the safe does give you an ability, but it's nothing required for progression. Besides bottles, there's an entirely different way to unlock some abilities this time around. You may have noticed that already, but we've been collecting some cold hard cash as we progress. Using this, and by selling some valuables gifted to us by the bad guys, we can purchase powers for Sly and the gang. Aside from one ability for Sly, these are also not required for progression, but are a fun thing to play around with. Hell, because I'm stupid, I didn't even know how to equip the new abilities until like 75% of the way through the game and just forgot I had them. Now that that's out of the way, what are the gang up to? Phase 2 of the plan sees Bentley hacking a terminal while we defend to gain access to a winch, Sly stealing some gems to use as a saw blade so we can get the wings off their mounting, and Bentley justifying his expensive RC hobby by dropping bombs on a few land-to-air missile carriers. Finally ready for the heist itself, the gang is ready to get down to brass tacks. Starting off with Bentley, we need to destroy the bridge to the other building to prevent reinforcements during our escape. Once he's done and having sustained only a minor concussion, the reins hand over to Sly for yet another dance-off, this time partnered with Carmelita. All this is done as a distraction while Murray cuts the wings free and skedaddles back to the van. A bit more RC chopper action while Murray waddles to the drawbridge and we've made off with our prize. Rajan, upset about having been made a fool of in his own house, flees back to his hidden jungle base where all that sweet, sweet spice is made. Fortunately for us and the general public, Rajan is using another clockwork part to aid in the production of said spice. So now we get to end this operation and steal back the clockwork heart. You know the drill at this point. First, we need to sneak in and take some photos to find out what we're dealing with. I spend way too long looking for the hidden passage inside because I guess I just wasn't paying attention during the scene where they show you where it is, but eventually I figured it out and we can take a few high quality pictures. Turns out only half the heart is being used for spice production and Rajan carries the other half with him at all times. This is just too big of a puzzle to figure out yet, so we need some more intel. Sly goes off to shut down the satellites powered by slave labor and bug Rajan's office with a literal bug. Meanwhile, Bentley uses the power of sound and the known sleep inducing powers of watermelon 
to lure Rajan around and steal his blueprints. With the extra intel acquired and Rajan now in hiding, we can finally form a plan to steal the heart. To drive Rajan out, we need to destroy the spice grinder to piss him off and flood the entire temple, destroying the entire valuable archaeological site so we can steal the heart. First things first, destroy the spice grinder. Sly, using the tried and true method of hiding in a barrel full of TNT, makes short work of this once I figure out how to not be seen and avoid lasers. Neela makes another appearance and I still don't trust her. She leads us through the jungle to a secret entrance, allowing us to lower the heart half on the ceiling. All that's left now is to steal Rajan's half, meaning we need some high explosives. Fortunately, Bentley made a deal with some black market guys. They'll give us a big bomb in exchange for a ruby from the temple, so Sly knocks it down and Murray lugs it over, running into only a few roadblocks along the way. Explosives in hand, Bentley uses a much bigger RC chopper to destroy the conveniently placed dam and flood the surrounding area. Now for Operation Wet Tiger, in which we use the big bomb from before to open up the temple's elephant mouth and tick the tiger off enough to step outside. Having successfully caused massive damage to a historical site, Rajan makes his appearance and Neela guides us on our approach to steal the heart. Neela runs off, Rajan promptly bodies Sly into next week, and Murray gets to box Rajan into submission. Unfortunately, Sly and Murray both get arrested along with Carmelita thanks to Neela, so now it's up to a literal turtle to break into the Contessa's prison and free everyone, right after he gets over a panic attack and learns to drive a stick. The Contessa, after poisoning her new husband and using his wealth to open a prison, is using very suspicious hypnotherapy to do some probably bad things to people. Bentley can't let anything happen to his friends and we need to break them out. We learn that Sly is in an isolation box and the Contessa is actually a part of the Claw Gang. She's been using Rajan Spice to enhance the hypnosis, meaning shutting down that operation conveniently made her life harder. Now that we know where Sly is, it's time to bust him out. We accomplish this by first using a train as a projectile weapon to bust down the prison walls, and then piloting the RC chopper to decimate the guards carrying motion tracking devices. Sly, presumably having already picked the lock hours ago, leaves prison and makes his way back to the hideout, stopping to steal a watch and a guard's participation trophy along the way. The next task on our agenda is breaking out Murray. This requires us to get him into an isolation chamber, hack into the encrypted cell block codes, steal the Contessa's keys, and break a giant attack robot disguised as a water tower that Bentley is definitely not just making up. While the crew does that, this seems like as good a time as any to talk about some level and mission design stuff. There have obviously been some changes to the way levels work coming from Sly 1. One of my favorites is the lack of pointless do X number of things missions with super high numbers. Remember having to smack all those chickens or having to shoot that ridiculous number of crabs I wouldn't shut up about? Things like that are gone to an extent here. Sure, we still have to steal some keys or hack some terminals, but those are restricted to between 3 and 6 a pop, where in Sly 1, I feel like it would have been 10 plus. Aside from Murray needing to smack around 50 guards, I can't really remember anything that seemed needlessly inflated. At least nothing so ridiculous that it pops into mind for me to mention now. And hey, while we're at it, I'll throw in Bentley's hacking minigame here, since it pops up a decent number of times. The hacking is done as a twin-stick shooter. Bentley's second life avatar needs to navigate to a dock to successfully hack the terminal, and this requires blasting through the firewall and circumventing some Norton antivirus ships. The minigame itself is fine, nothing to write home about, but nothing to pull your hair out over either. New enemy types are introduced often enough to keep things fresh, and I never found myself upset about having to go through the task of hacking a few terminals here and there. Hey, I guess there was an attack robot. Anyway, Murray is free now through the power of a spice-fueled Hulk rage. We try to duke it out with the Contessa, but she escapes our grasp using a surprise blimp, and we need to chase her down. We track the spider down to her home estate, which is conveniently housing the clockwork eyes to hypnotize people. The police have also decided to act and are besieging the castle at the same time we need to break in, making things just a little bit sticky. Nothing our crew can't handle with a few recon photos and a well thought out plan from Bentley. Turns out the Contessa is trying to hypnotize Carmelita, and well, it just wouldn't be the same without her failing over and over again to catch us, and we need the eyes anyway, so we resolve to break her out. Alright, so here's the initial plan. Murray is going to kidnap the head of security. Easy enough. Bentley is going to enter the catacombs to build a bad mojo box. Not sure what that is, but he seems to think it'll be enough to break the hypnosis device. Finally, Sly is going to enter the graveyard to stir up some ghosts and use them to convince Neela to up her firepower. What exactly is Bentley smoking in that van? Anyway, I absolutely hate this entire level. Playing as Sly, everything is fine. The thief moves provide enough mobility to navigate the twists and turns of this castle with little to no issue whatsoever. The issue lies in the other two-thirds of the dynamic trio. Bentley and Murray just don't have enough options to make navigating this vertical labyrinth anything other than a painful chore. We can argue that maybe I'm just stupid and miss some core gameplay feature, which is entirely possible, but that doesn't change the fact that this fat hippo needs to get to the third story 
two-story roof of Tim Burton's take on Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory, and I don't like it. It's a real shame because this is the only level to my mind that suffers from this problem to this degree, and it detracts from an otherwise fine part of the game. The missions are fun and interesting, but getting to and around them for more than half the squad is a chore and really dragged everything down. Minor note, this is a level that also has the required ability purchase. You need to purchase the Breath of the Wild hand glider here to proceed, so keep that in mind if you're low on cash. To make a two-hour story short, we do the stuff and eventually have everything we need to bust Carmelita free and confront the Contessa. One hypnosis device destroyed and a goofy eye obtained, but oh no, Neela took the other one and now we have to chase her down. This one actually got me a few times, but I do finally figure it out and now we get to fight the spider herself while Neela hangs out. Oh, but first Carmelita actually shoots Bentley down in the blimp thinking it's the Contessa getting away. The fight with the Contessa is fine so long as you don't get hit by her confusion blast. Smack her around a few times, get bodied in a cutscene, and now we break away to chase down Carmelita in a tank with Bentley. Contessa fight part two is pretty much just more of the first. A few whacks from the trusty cane and the spider goes down for the count. Now we can finally escape with the clockwork eyes and leave this whole mess behind us. Up next is Jean Bisson, a prospector frozen in ice for 120 years responsible for the shipment of spice across the globe and some deforestation. He is basically if Captain America were Canadian and evil. He's got the clockwork lungs, stomach, and claws, so we head off to his logging facility to get them back. I'll skip the recon photos this time and just let you know that the end goal here is to take the lungs and stomach powering three trains in the area. To do this, we'll have to perform various ridiculous antics and use a plane to get up high, gather some explosive gas, and land on top of the trains to pop the tops open. Bentley infiltrates the first train, darting and bombing his way through to acquire the first lung. Train number two is a bit more heavily guarded, so we need the RC chopper to clear out the missile defenses before handing the reins over to Sly to get our grubby little hands on yet another lung. John Bisson, now really angry over the loss of two clockwork parts, fully defends the final train himself, so we'll need to be extra sneaky this time around. Star pilot Neela shows up to miss every shot she takes, but a few shots from the RC chopper takes her down, and we make off with the clockwork stomach. If you feel like we just got a lot of parts back to back, you'd be right, and the gang even comments on it after the level. Oh hey, this also happened to shut down the entire spice distribution network. It's amazing how we always just so happen to solve massive problems through our thieving antics. Canadian Throwdown Part 2 sees us in a lumber camp again, going up against Jean Bisson. Something's wrong with the Northern Lights, and the big cow is probably responsible somehow, and I get the feeling we'll end up solving that issue while we're here. This whole level is kind of a blur for me. I vaguely remember something about a mammoth, some eagles, and manipulating a bear with some stinky fish. Even looking at the footage I recorded to write this script, the level just refuses to stick in my memory. I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with it per se, I think it's more so that everything has just been so crazy up to this point, combined with the fact that it's really, really hard to make an ice level stand out to me, that everything about the logging compound just falls right back out of my brain the moment it enters. The long and short of it is this. John is using some big goofy battery to steal energy from the Northern Lights. Arpeggio, who we've only seen and heard twice up to now, is headed over to collect the battery, and that'll be our ticket to his flying fortress to get the clockwork brain. In the meantime, we need to rig John's lumberjack games in our favor to win the clockwork talents. So we do just that, getting our hands on an ancient lumberjack manual from the ice, stealing eagle eggs as a surprise tool to use later, and eventually realizing that we're just not good enough and we'll need to cheat anyway. Unfortunately, expecting a criminal to play his own game honestly was really stupid, and Jean uses the power of intimidation to tie us in the game. A tie goes to the reigning champ, so Jean keeps the talons. He also finally gets it through his thick skull that we're the ones responsible for stealing the other parts and takes us prisoner. This eventually leads us to the fight with Jean, which is honestly my favorite of the entire game. We're in control of Bentley, and the power discrepancy means a brute strength battle just isn't going to happen. Instead, we lure Bisson around and give commands to Sly to trigger trap. Using saws, fire, and logs, Bisson goes down and we escape to board Arpeggio's flying fortress. While in prison, Bisson stole back all the clockwork parts we'd already stolen back and sold them to his parrot pal. So all the work we'd done up to now is worthless and the guys are really bummed about that. I mean, look how sad Murray looks here. Anyway, all the parts are on the same fortress we are, so all that's left is to beat up a parrot and steal them all back, right? Well, of course, it's not that simple. During our recon, we learned that Neela is, shockingly, a double agent for the Claw Gang, and Arpeggio is rebuilding clockwork. Our master plan is to shut down these spinning magnets holding things together, simple enough with the power to slow down time itself. Shutting these down had the unfortunate side effect of doing the exact opposite of what we wanted. Instead of ruining the whole plan, it actually locks the clockwork parts together, and Arpeggio's plan is fully revealed. He wants to merge his mind and body with clockwork to take over the bird and be all-powerful. In order to fuel the hate required to keep him immortal, he 
also needs to use the spice and hypnosis from the other gang members to turn all of Paris into ravenous animals, which would kinda be a bummer. Before he can realize his plan, though, and before we get to punch him even a single time, Neela commits another betrayal. She kills Arpeggio and takes over Clockwork's body, becoming the monster known as... Clocklaw. They really couldn't have thought of a better name than that, huh? Alright, well, whatever. Let's end this. Here's our to-do list. Shut down the blimp's engines, disable the hypnosis stuff to save Paris, and use some radar things to bring Carmelita here in a helicopter. Everyone gets their tasks, completes them to utter perfection, I only fall off once or twice, and now it's finally time for the final confrontation with the worst named boss in video game history. The final fight with Clocklaw is broken up into three sections. The first, much like the last game, is done as an on-rail shooter, this time in a helicopter instead of a jet pack. I, again, just kind of didn't care for this sequence. I mean, it's fine, I guess. Just a little tedious after a while, and Carmelita never shuts up. Part 2 forces us to jump around on some falling platforms with some wonky gravity to save our friends after Clocklaw blows up the floating fortress. This time, we get to smack the big metal bird around up close, jumping from point to point to avoid fire and take her down. I like this part way more. It's far more engaging and feels way more intense. The final phase is to blow up Clocklaw before she can regenerate using her hate chip. To do this, all we need to accomplish is have Murray pry the beak open and Bentley drop a few tactical bombs down her gullet. And just like that, the game is done. This chapter of the Cooper Gang's adventure is over. Carmelita lets Bentley and Murray go in exchange for taking Sly prisoner, but he ends up escaping anyway because we just can't have a third game with Sly in jail. So that's it. Sly Cooper Band of Thieves is done. Overall, this is an incredible example of how a sequel should be done. The core elements from the first game are improved, expanded upon, and added to in some truly fantastic ways. Level design, is superb in mostly every single mission. Having missions be an interconnected part of the story instead of just little tasks to do made everything feel like I was actually working towards a goal and performing an admittedly ridiculous heist. In the end, I think this game is fantastic. If you've never played it, please do. It is so worth it in any year. I won't reveal just yet what the next game is in our lineup, but I am coming back for Sly 3 after. Sorry for disappearing for a few months, by the way. Life, work, and a few other things got in the way, but I am back on the horse now and plan to get a new video out hopefully every two weeks. I'll keep the community page updated if that ends up changing, so keep an eye out. As always, let me know how you felt in the comments down below, leave a like if you enjoyed the video, and subscribe if you're feeling extra spicy today. I'll see everyone next time.